A really great way to finish the set that was Unexpected Greeting by Michael Griffin. And that was the Michael Griffin Octet with players Mish Manjanath, Nick Bowd, Jacob Parks, Devon Raman, Aaron Blakely, Noel Mason and George Greenhill. And of course, our sax player, Michael Griffin. Hey, thank you so much for coming along, Michael. Thank you. Nice to be back. Now, you've recorded three albums in this space, haven't you? Actually, four. I did four. Yeah. Um, downstairs. What is it that you like about the space? Probably the best thing, to be honest, is that you're all in, in the one room together, which I think is um, really good, especially if you're recording, um, doing a jazz recording. You know, you want to be in the room the communication. together. Yeah. I actually hate being in studios where you're isolated and they have the drummer in a different room and you have to use the headphones and you can't really see them. And, you know, the I guess the sound people think it... That it can sound better. Well, they can control the volumes and stuff, but yeah, you don't have but the same communication. But you lose a lot of magic that can mm. actually happen. It's kind of frustrating. Uh, and I never really wear the headphones either. Yeah. You know, I just just turn up and try and play it as if you were playing live, live in a gig somewhere. Because yeah. that's sort of what you want. You know? It is. Yeah. Now you've come from a background of um, music, haven't you? Was your dad a musician? Certainly was. In fact, he played the same instrument. As me, or I should say I play the same instrument <laughs> as him. <laughs> Another saxophone player. Yeah. Yeah. And so what sort of memories do you have from when you were little and growing up that made you think of becoming a musician yourself? Well, I remember being about th- three years old and my dad used to play downstairs and uh, I used to sort of crawl downstairs. I guess I was just attracted to a, a sound and I was like, what's that sound? So I used to crawl down the stairs and then open the door while my dad was practicing and he'd have to call out to my mother to come and Drag get me. Drag you back upstairs again yeah. 30 times for the afternoon. But I guess I kind of forgot that, but that happened a lot when I was a kid. And I think one time I even got up and I was tried to like, I was about f- four years old and I tried to reach my hands up, like, give it to me, let me play it, let me play it. And he said, maybe when you're older. So I guess even at that age, it was way before I started playing it, but I obviously liked that sound. There's something about the saxophone that, I was drawn to, you know. Feels like home, I suppose, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So ahead of all the other instruments, did you try some of the other ones? The first instrument was piano, actually. Um, and when I used to learn piano, I'd already heard, like, Thelonious Monk and all these jazz pianists, and I would try and imitate them. But if you're six years old, you don't know what they're doing, so it sounds like a so- bunch of... <laughs> and the piano teacher used to hate that, and she'd say, stop doing that, just play Yankee Doodle. Oh, and that sort of thing. So oh. I did that for a while, and then I played trumpet for a little while, and then nothing, and then the saxophone. Back to saxophone. Yeah. But I, I suppose when you've got that background of having some of the other instruments, that's really useful when you're composing, surely. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, when I was learning those, I was about seven years old, so at that age, not really. But <clears throat> I did get inter- interested in the piano when I was in high school. And I used to spend a lot of my spare time at lunch, you know, going up to the music area and finding a piano. And I would, um, I used to ask to borrow these things called the the rule book. Rule book is a book that has lots of um, jazz standards in it, lots of songs in there. And I would learn them on the piano. And that did a lot for me, I suppose, just learning about harmony and how to play piano. And So learning by yourself then, without a tutor? Yeah, I was just there just learning it myself. Wow, wow. Now, a lot of your um, professional work that you've been doing around the place, because you have been moving around a huge amount, Mm -hmm. um, working really hard, which is amazing. It's great that you can get so many gigs. How is it different from, say, getting a tertiary education before you get started? If you start learning on the road, what advantages do you think there have been in doing that? Well, I guess the sooner that you just start trying to get out there and make something happen, this the sooner that you start to build a name for yourself, I guess. That's kind of what it's about. It's not really about a piece of paper. No one's going to go, oh, you've got a piece of paper, so yes, we'll give you this gig. It's more, I think you've just got to start. Do you think it's like a contact? It's more a contact game? I mean, you obviously have to have the, the skill to get around, but the, the who you know, not what you know? Yeah, sure, that's part of it. I guess, I mean, I put on my first gig when I was about 18, 17, I think. I was 17, and I played at the El Rocco in King's Cross, I put together my own quintet, and we were all like 17, 18 years old. So I sort of started then. Mm-hmm. And that was after I'd already done some of the Morrison stuff, and I guess I started putting myself out there really young. I was like 18, and I was already putting gigs on, 
gigs that paid nothing and gigs that you get 10 bucks for at the end and stuff, but it was just starting, just get on with it. That's it. You know, some people are very, oh, I'm not, not ready for this, I'm not ready to record and... They I want would, to be perfect, don't they? Yeah, I, I was already sending um, demos to the ABC when I was about 20 and then they actually right. called back and said, we want you to record mm. an album for us. That's when I did Unexpected Greeting mm. and I was like 21 when I did that and then... I was applying for festivals and then Melbourne Jazz Festival picked me up and they said, do you want to do a spot in 2012? Uh, I said, yeah. So, you know, just building things up and going overseas and you sort of just got to get on with it, really. So the, the business side of things sounds like this is this became really strengthened within you too because I sometimes worry about that when, um, you know, people go into tertiary education, they come out really great at their art but they haven't learned the business side of show business. You know, if I'm being completely blunt, sometimes I think as great as it is, it's an incredible environment to be in and you learn so much. It's a bit of a, I don't know if it's like that when you leave there, just in terms of it's a, it's an incredible place to learn skills and learn from all those great people and things that you get to do. But yeah, you know, there, there could be someone, I'm sure there is, if there's not, there should be some sort of a, a business side of it or just something that, that talks about that. So you're yeah. not leaving there sort of pie in the sky going, all right, I've got a piece of paper now. What someone do we call, do next? Someone call me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so negotiating <clears throat> your own deals, talking to venue owners. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, making sure that you've got all your rates and conditions sorted out and getting think, your demos out. Basically building the, the, the snowball, isn't it? I think that would be a great idea. And it would be nice to have some experienced musicians that would talk about maybe some hard times that they've been through and things to watch out for yeah. and you can fall into certain things and you know that I think is a side that people should know about I feel like I've been through some of those things and had times where you feel like I don't want to do this anymore and you know being in that world you can go down certain paths and and so forth and I think people could benefit from learning about that how to deal with those situations Mm. um just in terms of you know and also that your life is going to be very different from so someone that you went to school with, if you're 26, your friend might be married and they might have all this thing and you, your life is going to be different from that if you're applying yourself to, you know, the arts and music. and You can't compare you know, it, can't can compare you? can't compare it. And no. you've got to sort of be nice to have people talk about that sort of thing because it can be a bit of a shock, I suppose, and you can... Or about. you can de- devalue yourself, I think, can't you? You, en- right. you end up going, well, I don't have a house and a three kids and a dog, so therefore I am not successful. But yeah, exactly. It, everyone's got a different idea of what success is. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. That's great. So you come out with lots of different size ensembles, don't you, with each different gig. And you've got um, one coming up on the 5th of December. Yes. Well, that's um, at Potts Point Hotel. And um, what size group is that going to be with? It's an octet. Mm-hmm. It's really the Michael Griffin octet, uh, but we're calling it the Potts Point Big Band. <laughs> um, Specially made, is it? Bespoke? Yes, that's right. Big mm-hmm. enough. Um, big enough band. That's pretty cool. Potts Point Big Enough Band. That's yep. actually not a bad idea. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the 5th of December. Is that um, What time is that going to be? 7.30 on level one. Mm-hmm. So I've been playing at Potts Point Hotel every Sunday for about a year and a half now with a quartet. Mm-hmm. We play 3 p.m. until 6.30 p.m. Are those going to keep going? Oh, yes, you bet they are. Great. Um, and then we're just having once a month upstairs on level one is going to be the Michael Griffin Octet, um, which be- would be pretty exciting. Fantastic. Well, that's something to look forward to. So go along to the Potts Point Hotel and you can see Michael Griffin's Octet there, the Big Enough Band. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Michael, thank, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me.